the creation of statues is more than just a decoration. The artist is actually a creator. And so by making an image, you, in a certain sense, bring it into being. Now, that doesn't mean that it comes into being in this world. You can't draw a snake and have it wriggle away from you. But it means that, in some sense, in, in the world of the gods, for, from the point of view of a temple, from the point of view of a tomb, it would be the world of the dead. What is shown is something that actually exists. These statues are made. However, they are referred to as being born because when they undergo that uh, whatever ritual, they are empowered, activated. They can, they can function as more than a statue. The statue is, is where the god comes and, and takes up residence. The, the god fills the statue with his essence. And so they're not just worshipping a stone idol. They, they really believe the divine essence of the god is in there. And they are performing all this ritual before the god. And the whole idea is that they, they, they look after the god's needs. A deity like the lord or lady of a manor would be uh, fed each day, clothed each day, anointed each day, entertained each day, um, and so that they would be in a good mood, so that contact would be friendly with them. To protect the god in his temple home, huge gateways hid what went on inside. Most Egyptians were forbidden to enter the temple. All they would ever have seen of it was this view of the front gates, the pylons. For the priests inside, the pylons represented the limits of the ordered world. For them, the temple was a model of the universe. The greatest mystery of the temple lay in a shrine at the very back of the enclosure. There, the most important rite of all was conducted. Each day, the original moment of creation was ritually reenacted, a creation that had its origin in the chaos the Egyptians most feared. In the beginning was a great vast, well, by vast, infinite. Uh, and eternal watery chaos called the noon. And creation happens when within this chaos a creator deity appears. Being alone, this god cannot create in the uh, sort of general male sexual uh, uh, manner. So this god either creates by uh, spitting out the next generation or masturbating. Uh, and that and sometimes performing an act of sex upon himself. Uh, and this creates the next generation of deities who are in fact male and female. These deities that then interacted and by their sexual union uh, produced the, the universe. And this whole interaction of male and female principle was what kept the universe going. The ancient Egyptians believed that at night, as soon as the sun had set, the sun god impregnated his own mother, the sky. Just as the creator god, Amun, had swallowed his own semen and then spat forth the first divine children, in a similar way, the sun god entered the sky, his mother, through her mouth. He then passed through his mother's body to be born again at dawn, father to himself, self-creating, the source of his own power. Karnak was a model of the universe at the point of creation. So each morning, at the moment the sun rose, a rite was performed to encourage Amun to give birth to himself and bring order out of chaos. Three thousand years ago, astronomers based at Karnak would have worked through the night to calculate the exact moment at which the rite should begin. At a signal from the attendant of the stars, the workers of the god's domain would be woken. Behind the high pylons and enclosure walls, fires would be lit. In a short while, the sacred service would begin. 
priests, visible in the shadows thanks to their pure white linen garments, would prepare themselves for the daily rite. A select group of the high priest and the purest of the pure, imbued with the divine spirit of the water of the sacred lake, would prepare their journey through the temple to the shrine, the Holy of Holies. Taking with them candles to light their way, incense burners to hold out before them, oils for the sacred unction of the statue, and freshly made clothes of red, green, blue and white linen for the god, they advanced, first through the swamp of creation, the columned hyperstyle hall. From there, into ever darker, more secluded areas. They would wind their way through passages to a room hidden to the left of the main axis of the temple, the Shrine of Amun. With the doors of the Kem, the god's private chamber, opened, the high priest would lead the ritual which, in some sense, now lost, empowered the god. We cannot know for certain which statue of the god was placed here. A hundred years ago, the public would have been told it looked like this. Today, all the statues of Amun have disappeared from Karnak. But on a balance of probability, experts, like Dr. Robbins, now believe Amun in the main sanctuary may have looked like this. With the left hand gripping the erect phallus and the right raised with a flail as a sign of power. Some of the religious imagery that we see here at Karnak may seem rather crude, but what you have to remember is that, that the Egyptians are trying to conceptualize ideas that they have absolutely no knowledge of. I mean, they don't know really what happened at the creation. They don't know what happens in the next life. But what they do is very subtly take images from their own experience of, of this world and use those to try and conceptualize what uh, the creation or life after death might be like. Because the cult was secret and never written down, no one knows exactly what rituals would have been performed for the deity in the Holy of Holies. Nor do we know who would have been allowed to approach and serve the god. But the most recent research talks of a special role for the high priestess known as the wife of God and her troop of musicians. In order to understand exactly what the god's wife did, we need to look at another title that she also had, and that's the title of God's Hand. And if we go back to the creation myth, the version where the creator God brought the whole world into being by masturbating with his hand, then we begin to get an inkling of what the God's wife did. In ancient Egyptian, the word for hand is actually of feminine grammatical gender. So it was very easy for the Egyptians to separate it out from the creator god and identify it as a different deity, as a goddess. The fact that she's a god's hand shows us that her primary job is to stimulate the god to, to keep performing uh, the, or reenacting the whole uh, notion of creation so that, that the ordered world will continue to exist and chaos won't take over. Dr. Robbins believes that sound played a crucial role in the rituals of the hand of God. These are not inanimate statues. They are statues which can hear. The God's hand, the wife of God, would have started rhythmically clapping. There would have been musicians playing the Bennet, the Egyptian harp. And the sacred rattles of the fertility goddess Hathor marked with her special sign. Together with the smell of incense and the dancing of the women, such sounds would have made the god more amenable and would have stimulated him to reenact creation. Whether this stimulation was sexual or not, we don't know for sure. What we know 
is that through this strange cult of the creation of strength and order through divine masturbation, the god also forged and sustained the power of the most important human being in Egypt, the pharaoh. Ancient Egyptians believed that Pharaoh was the god on earth. It is he who is shown performing the rites for the gods, even though he didn't do this every day, but delegated it to his priests. But once a year, Pharaoh had to reassert his legitimacy to govern as a god. He did this by enacting a rite unique to him, something from the climax of which even the high priest was excluded. Every year, at the time of the flood, Pharaoh would journey up the Nile from the royal palace at Memphis in the Nile Delta. Then the statue of Amun would be taken from its sanctuary at Karnak, hidden in a cloth of linen, and put aboard the royal barge. Ordinary Egyptians would gather along the bank of the river to witness Pharaoh accompany the hidden image of Amun to the gates of Karnak's smaller, sister temple, two miles up the Nile at Luxor. No one but the Pharaoh and his wife knew the exact nature of the rite to be performed, but all were aware that at the end Pharaoh would emerge a god once more. Here at Luxor, a temple associated with the god Amun at his youthful, most vigorous period, the pharaoh would seclude himself with his wife and the statue in a small dark room at the back of the temple. And so one has to imagine somehow the king's conception and divine birth are reenacted ritually in the temple. Was there an actual sexual con uh, contact or was it all symbolic? Who knows? But we do know that as the result of this ritual, uh, in theory, the king has been regenerated, recreated, if you want, his right to rule, his, uh, his royal power, and uh, Amun has once again uh, accepted him uh, and revealed him to the world as his legitimate heir and representative on earth. The king now is a very special person. He carries this sort of dual dimension. He still is obviously mortal because everybody knows he's going to die, but he has this divine aspect to him. The god rendered earthly power to the pharaohs. In return, the pharaohs provided homage to the god in the form of gifts to his domain. The records of Karnak tell us of over 400,000 head of cattle, 700,000 hectares of land, as well as a fleet of boats. The greatest service Pharaoh performed for the god was to build for him. What had begun in the third millennium BC as a small shrine underwent a radical change at the height of Egypt's power. Military victories and trading links established in their wake funded ever more generous donations by the Pharaohs to the god who seemed to work for them. Karnak had become the great dynastic cult center of the pharaohs, the powerhouse of the empire, probably the greatest economic power in the kingdom. Papyri tell of the great expeditions financed by the priests of Karnak. Amun, as well as being god of creation, was also god of the eastern desert, and all of its great mineral wealth of gold and other precious metals belonged to him. One text of the time gives an idea of what it must have been like on one of the treks organized by the priests. We are living in hell with no supplies. We spend the day eyeing the road home with longing. The mosquito attacks in sunlight. The sandfly stings. They suck at every blood vessel. The heat never lets up. Expeditions went far into the south, beyond Nubia, to bring back exotic animals for Amun's delight and diversion. The gold that was brought to Karnak between 1500 and 1000 BC exceeded 30 tons. The precious blue lapis lazuli was transported across the desert from the coast hundreds of miles to the northeast. 
by 1100 BC, Karnak was the center of an international trading network unparalleled in Egypt's history. Every pharaoh felt the need to leave his own mark on Karnak and add to the great line of creation. 